Hey folks, I'm sorry I can't be there in person today. This is one of those situations in the life of the School of Music where I literally have to be in two places at once at exactly the same time. So instead of delivering this lecture face-to-face, -face, I'm going to present it to you via video lecture and I'm gonna ask our TAs to help us out in moving us from slide to slide and also moving back and forth between this video and the various interpolated videos that we're borrowing from other sources. So we start some new material today, building on the work that we've already done. And we're going to begin by talking about tone poem and ballet at the very end of the 19th century. Now we've spoken about the reasons why in the European tradition composers focused upon certain genres, certain formal structures. And we've talked about the German tradition of composition as it dominated much of European orchestral composition throughout the 19th century. And we've talked about Beethoven in the first half of the century and Wagner in the second half of the century. And we've talked about the role of the symphony, the concerto and opera throughout the century. We've also talked about the fact that over the course of the 19th century, there was a gradual shift away from harmony and structure as the principal organizing ideas behind form and a move towards sound and rhythm. That move towards sound and rhythm occurs toward the end of the 19th century. And it also tends to occur in the music of composers outside the German orbit. So we've seen it in the music of Paris-based composers like Debussy and Ravel, and for that matter, Stravinsky. And we're also gonna see it in the work of Eastern European composers from the Eastern European companies, countries of Czechoslovakia and Romania, and especially from Ukraine and Russia itself. And it's these composers toward the end of the 19th century who put a particular emphasis upon tone poem and even more upon ballet. And as you see on the screen, the question that we have to ask ourselves is why these particular formal structures? And you already know that there are some reasons we've discussed which might lead them toward these forms. First off, the programmatic forms, the tone poem and the ballet, neither one tends to use sung or spoken text, but each tends to have narratives of either very little or not quite so literal narrative structure. And so they're looking for musical forms that can reflect these unique narratives, and that's an important word, unique narratives. And they're looking for ways of organizing those musical forms that are not so dependent upon the inherited German forms of the concerto, the symphony, the sonata, and the opera. Well, one of the ways that they do this is by looking for stories, and they're looking for stories that can dictate unique forms, again, dictate unique forms. Now, we know the tone poem we conventionally understand to be a unique form, orchestral, with a programmatic narrative, and generally in one movement, more or less. Although some tone poems, like the Don Quixote by Strauss, have elements of the theme and variations and elements of the cello concerto, really the driving consideration for Strauss in Don Quixote is to tell that story, that episodic story. We also know from ballet that ballet is pictorial and sometimes has a narrative and sometimes it's a selection of pretty pictures. But in both cases, the tone poem and especially the ballet, especially with Eastern European and Russian composers like Rimsky, like Stravinsky, the ballet is particularly important. And so we're going to talk some about the ballets of these Russian composers. And then we're going to loop back a little bit and talk about new and experimental developments in Germany right around the same period, the period immediately before the First World War. In a moment, I'm going to ask you your TAs to shift over to YouTube and play you this particular excerpt, which is the New York Philharmonic Orchestra with Igor Stravinsky conducting the first of what we think of as his Russian nationalist ballets, The Firebird, which is based upon a mythological story and was intended to be danced and was danced as a ballet by Diaghilev's Ballet Russe in Paris. You'll, your M. Creed people will have recognized the young dashing composer who introduces this, but this is Stravinsky, uh, pro conducting, excuse me, conducting the finale of his ballet, The Firebird, itself based upon a ballet which was kind of used as a model a ballet by his teacher, Rimsky-Korsakov, called The Golden Cockerel. So we've just heard Stravinsky conducting the finale of The Firebird, and of course that was the inimitable Leonard Bernstein Kaulik and all introducing Stravinsky. And as we M. Creed folks know, uh, taking a little bit of the credit for Stravinsky, as he likewise took the credit for the Ives Second Symphony. I'm going to move on now 
And we're going to talk about another appearance of this particular movement, the finale of the Firebird. This is something that will probably not be familiar to most of you, or well, it might be familiar to your parents or even your grandparents. But if there are any prog rockers in the house, then you might know that this prog rock band, Yes, in the 1970s, often used the f finale, the ending of the first part of the Firebird, as the pre-show music as they went on stage, just before they went on stage to play live. So you might ask yourself, what associations are these prog rockers, these rock and roll musicians of the 70s, who like to claim that they were influenced by classical music? What associations are they borrowing? Why are they using this piece of audio modernism, this first of the three ballets of Stravinsky, to introduce their own live set? This is Yes from 1975. And again, we'll ask the TAs to just play enough of this so that you can kind of get a flavor of what it must have been like. We're going to continue on right now, and we're going to talk about the second of Stravinsky's three Russian nationalist ballets. This is a work from 1911. The Firebird was from 1909. This work is from 1911. And this is a work which is based in folkloric sources. Stravinsky was very much influenced by the members of the Mighty Handful and by Mikhail Glinka, especially, and Glinka's interest in and actual ethnographic fieldwork in collecting folk song. And Stravinsky, in all three of these ballets, and especially in Petrushka, borrows from folk song. He borrows hurdy-gurdy tunes, and he borrows dance tunes, and he borrows the tunes of Russian lullabies and Russian folk songs. And he uses them in this ballet, which is dated 1911. We're going to see a, an animation in just a moment, which kind of picks up on some of the story. But the essential premise of Petrushka is that it's kind of a magic show set in a folk carnival. A carnival rolls into town and this magician comes out from the carnival tent and he introduces these various animatronic characters, these puppets so-called, a ballerina, uh, a moor so-called in the parlance of the time, and uh, the clown, the sad clown character called Petrushka. And those of you who know uh, who recall some other sad clown characters from this same period. Uh, Pagliacci would be one. You can even think that there's a sort of parallel here or a foreshadowing here in 1911's Petrushka of the magical play, the magical carnival that shows up in the cabin of Dr. Caligari. This is nowhere near as dark a story, but it is a story about magic and super superstition and folktale. And uh, it does feature this sort of central a puppet figure who we're going to see again in music of Schoenberg. So here's an animation made in the 1950s based upon the story of Petrushka. And again, we'll ask the TAs to play just a, a few seconds of this so you can kind of get a feel for it. So there's a 1956 animation of Petrushka, but uh, I particularly like this particular uh, production. This is a, a, a recorded, video recorded version of what I think is probably a pretty much a straightforward ballet show. Now, Petrushka is set up in a set of four tableaus, sort of four scenes for tableaus or four pictures. And the opening scene is called the Shrove Tide Fair. It's specifically set in a carnival. And at this carnival, you'll see uh, folk dancers and soldiers dancing, and you'll see magic lanterns, and you'll see a musician playing the crank organ called the hurdy-gurdy. And you'll see the introduction of both a number of themes that Stravinsky borrowed or invented in order to tell this story of this clown who comes to life in this love triangle. But you'll also get a chance to see something of the body vocabulary, the movement vocabulary, and very importantly, you'll see the magi magician introducing the three characters who are going to be the love tri triangle in Petrushka. And I want you to pay particular attention to a couple of things that have to do with Schmirk. You should be making notes about Schmirk throughout this entire presentation because this is all material that will show up on quizzes. Particularly, I want you to pay attention to rhythm, the way that rhythm interacts, how pulses work, how symmetrical or asymmetrical phrases are constructed. Secondly, I want you to pay attention to the sound of the orchestra. What instruments are played in what register, with what kinds of technique and what kinds of articulation. I'm going to suggest to you that this is a particularly percussive orchestra, bright, high, a lot of percussive sounds. Doesn't sound like a German orchestra to me. Doesn't even sound like a, the orchestra of a French composer like Debussy. It's a particular way of organizing a ballet structure, a narrative structure without words, around sound and rhythm. And 
finally, and maybe the most important, the most subtle thing, the thing I want you to listen for most closely, it's a real thumbprint of Stravinsky and indeed of a lot of the Russian composers, it was the way that certain textures, blocks of sound, move from one to the other. There's not a lot of variation. There's not a lot of smooth gesture where we have a one idea and then it completes and it goes to another idea. It's more like kind of a mobile sculpture, like the kinds that hang in the atrium of the sub where you look overhead and it's these hanging pieces of metal on chain. And as the wind takes them, they move in relationship to one another. It's this mobile sculpture. Well, I want to suggest that Stravinsky's orchestrations, important word, that his orchestrations and his use of these blocks of sound as structural ideas are kind of like a mobile where we have an idea and an idea and they kind of move across one another, they drift or they collide or one's heard in front of the other and so on and so forth. These blocks of sound are quite different in character. So you can hear when one goes to the other, often without much preparation, sometimes even overlapping. It's almost like one block of sound is drifting to cover another one. You'll hear initial ideas, you'll hear follow-up ideas, you'll hear these contrasting ideas. And in each case, I want you to pay attention to sound, the sound, the timbre, the orchestration, the register, the range, the articulation, the phrasing. I want you to play, pay attention to the way these blocks of sound interact with each other. And one more thing I'll add. This is not really music in which there is conventional root motion. We don't hear conventional preparation and resolution of cadences. We don't hear even phrase structure. Quite the contrary. In a lot of places, we hear single chords that are repeated or two chords alternating in a kind of vamp that just doesn't really have much harmonic motion. Or we hear ostinati, bass lines or melodic figures that are repeated and repeated and repeated without much harmonic movement, without much conventional root motion. And that gets at this idea that these composers are not organizing their pieces around harmonic motion or around conventional modulation or conventional preparation and resolution of dissonance or of root motion. They've got a block of sound or an ostinato or two chords oscillating or two chords bitonally sounding one against the other. And they, kind of, they, they, they smash these together as if they're the pieces of the mobile rotating in space. And I think that's quite distinctive. It's one of the things I actually love about this music. I think it's especially fruitful, especially productive when it's setting up the sound and the associations and the thematic blocks of sound that are associated with different characters, with the magician with the peasant dance, with the soldier's dance, with the ballerina, because those are the blocks of sound that are going to help tell this story. So we'll ask the TAs to play a good fair chunk of this first of four tableaus, the first tableau of four in Stravinsky's 1911 ballet Petrushka. So Petrushka, one of, the, one of my absolute favorites, uh, just a piece I love. I love Stravinsky's music and I love the way that this piece works. I think one of the things, honestly, I respond to is the folkloric nature of it and the, the way the rhythm works and the sound of the orchestra and the distinctive, sometimes modal, sometimes pentatonic, sometimes symmetrical or, or synthetic scale melodies that he borrows from folklore or that he imitates in the style of folklore. It's a kind of thing that I really very much appreciate in the music of people like Rimsky or of Bela Bartok in The Next Generation. If there's time, I'll ask the TAs to play this animation for, of the first tableau, the same music that we've just heard. Uh, I think it's a pretty good storytelling, and, and even though it's not uh, a live ballet production, I kind of love the way that this animation sets up the sort of key tropes, the key ideas, the key symbols, the key characters that we associate with this ballet. So this is an animation of the first tableau of Petrushka. So it's a kind of fun animation, tells us a lot. And then finally, if there's time, we're gonna do this. And if there's not time, TAs will tell you, you are going to go away and you're going to work with this visual score. I want you to spend some time, now that we've listened, now that we know the scenario, now that we've pointed to some characteristics about rhythm and timbre and texture and orchestration and blocks of sound. Now I want you to see if you can literally see it in the score. So TAs, this is the 1911 version, it's the original version of Petrushka before he reorchestrated it. And I want you to pay particular attention to the way that instruments work, the way that harmony works, the way that blocks of sound work, the way that rhythms work. Okay. And however much time we have in class, please take good notes because this is fair game for testing. And if there isn't much time in class, you know darn sure that you're going to get out there and work on this with your practice playlist. Please note that also that this is the final tableau. This is the fourth section of four in the 1911 orchestration of Petrushka. So we've spent time with two of the three 
Russian nationalist ballets that Stravinsky wrote very much under the influence of the Mighty Handful and of his own teacher, Rimsky-Korsakov, one of the members of the Mighty Handful. And of course, this is a piece, The Rite of Spring, La Sacre du Printemps, which premiered in 1913 and was widely understood, widely perceived, widely described as being an absolute revolution in music, as a moment when musical modernism arrived. Now, I think we could argue that. I think we could say that there are other precursors of musical modernism. But certainly, I think that this piece, in the degree to which Stravinsky and his producer Diaghilev and the choreographer Nijinsky, they intentionally broke rules. Some of you may have heard that there was a riot at the premiere of the Red of Spring. Well, there were protests and people felt very strongly about it and there were people hissing in the galleries and whatnot. I'm not sure it was actually a riot, but I think that both Stravinsky and Diaghilev understood if they sold it as a riot, if they claimed that a riot was there, well, that notoriety was going to help sell, just like any pop star, like, I don't know, a Kardashian understands that notoriety and controversy sells. So this is a piece of music which was based in 1913. It's the third of the Russian nationalist ballets. Sometimes I think we could describe this as, a, as an exemplar of a kind of primitivism, a portrayal of music distant in time, right? It's called literally Scenes from Pagan Russia. I'm not sure that's really the basis that they were using. In fact, they called it scenes from pagan Russia, scenes from before Christianity came to Russia. But the fact of the matter is they were at least as much influenced by modern circuses and by Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. This is another one of those animated documentaries, but it gives actually a pretty good description of how the Red of Spring, Spring came to be written, by whom, for what ballet company, with what audiences in mind, and with this kind of quite conscious sense that they were going to seek the controversy that would help to herald this new age of modernism. Again, we're going to think about sound, we're going to think about rhythm, we're going to think about orchestration, we're going to think about the way that movement vocabularies themselves, the way that people move in the dancing, is very contrary to predominant models. It's very anti-19th century, it's very anti-German. It is self-consciously highly primitive and thus very, very modernistic. And for those of you out there who are ballet people, if you know about a Petitpas style classical French and Russian ballet, you'll know very quickly in this video and the next one that this ain't that. So again, make good schmerg notes, be prepared to identify this either by sound or in score for purposes of testing. So from 1913, this is a documentary about the inception of the Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. So the TAs had a little bit of opportunity to play you that animation, which, like the Strauss animations, I think it actually, although it's amusing, which is nice because it makes it memorable, I think it does a pretty good job of telling the story. If there's time, uh, I'd love to ask the TAs to play the first section of this film, which is a, which is a, a live action film, more or less a documentary, although it's all been played by actors, called Riot at the Right. And this opening scene in the film kind of tells the story of how, how the right came to be written gives you a flavor of some of the characters of Stravinsky himself, of the impresario Diaghilev, of the various ballet dancers involved, particularly the notorious and brilliant choreographer and dancer Václav Nijinsky. Nijinsky had choreographed for a number of works, a number of productions for the Ballet Russe, uh, most notably for the Prelude of the Afternoon of a Farm, which we have discussed back in the 1890s. And so this live action film gives slightly fictionalized, slightly romanticized, slightly soft focus, but I think pretty good feeling for what it was like to be part of this remarkable circle of people who made this 1913 composition happen. And yes, there are absolutely queer subtexts here, and they're intentional because these were complex people, and Diaghilev himself was an out gay man, which in 1913 Paris was kind of an amazing thing. So however much time there is, we'll see the first couple of minutes maybe of the opening scenes of the riot at the right. And then finally, we're going to close this video, the TAs may have more to do, with a reconstruction by the Joffrey Ballet of the original 1913 choreography that Nijinsky made for the Rite of Spring. Now, sometimes people look at this uh, video recording of a live ballet production from uh, the 1980s by the Joffrey, and they think, oh, it's sort of comical, and it looks like parody, or it, it, we might laugh at it. But I want us to remember in 1913 that this was perceived as absolutely revolutionary. It was revolutionary in every aspect, in its sound, in its orchestration, in the intensity of the orchestra, 
in the complexity of the polyrhythms, in the crashing bitonal dissonances, in the movement vocabulary that the dancers are using, in the costuming, in the set design, in the paintings that were done by Leon Bakst, and on top of everything else, the way that it tells a story, uh, a really kind of stark folkloric story, even though they made it up, about how a young woman each year in this hypothetical, this fictional village, is selected and volunteers to dance herself to death for the sake of a fruitful harvest. So it's a very shocking topic. Seems a little shocking to us right now, but imagine how shocking it was in Paris of 1913. And of course, that was the intention. So as you listen, and as you watch, and especially if you know the music, notice how closely Nijinsky's choreography, radical though it is, notice how his choreography follows the music's own impulses. It's really kind of remarkable when you see it in that light. So that's about where we're going to try to get today. We have spoken about three of the ballets of Igor Stravinsky, the three Russian primitivist ballets, most, in, most notably including the 1913 Les Sacres du Printemps, The Rite of Spring, a work which at the time and since then has conventionally been understood as a moment when music of the 20th century really began, because it was so radically different in every aspect of its conception, sound, rhythm, harmony, orchestration, timbre, dynamics, the size of the orchestra, the nature of the choreography, the radical nature of the costuming and the design, the very shocking content of the ballet. And all of that shock was intended by Diaghilev and Stravinsky. When we come back next class, we're gonna come back, we're gonna loop back to Germany and we're gonna loop back to Germany in both Vienna and also Berlin to a school of composers who were quite self-consciously quite experimental, who never really found a very large audience, but who really heralded, really brought into play a system of musical organization which was going to dominate much of European concert music through much of the 20th century. And it begins with the work of this composer, Arnold Schoenberg. So I'm going to hand it back to the TAs right now. I'm going to encourage you to take good notes and maybe even go back and review this video. Certainly review all the items on that playlist for the next quiz that we have coming up. And I'll see you next class. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, TAs. Bye.